Hi, how are you doing? Oh, uh, I'm doing good. Uh, thank you very much. It turns out to uh, one person uh, did not watch, watch the, the, the pilot episode that I was trying to give them. Another person had to bow out because of some stomach bug. I mean, I had a little stomach bug, but ended up recovering. So uh, it's just going to be us tonight. Okie doke. I'm here to help whatever way I can. Okay. Well, it's uh, well, it's an honor to meet you, Sue. So because um, those um, wait, wait, wait. okay, it's, uh, there is there is another thing I not actually know you for besides My Little Pony, Elf. <laughs> yeah, um, that's probably the most well known of the movie parts that I played is that one. Yeah, because uh, you're the you're the guy in the mailroom that Buddy befriends, and uh, he says he's from work release, and then uh, and then you give him uh, the idea of putting syrup and coffee. Buddy puts. Uh, some uh, the whole load of soap in the coffee just like because you can't handle bonus because from the North Pole and then uh and he's and then you're both like lying down and you're like oh no I gotta get out of the flow that's what got me in a flow and you said you were like 26 in the movie but you didn't you didn't feel like it well you didn't look like <laughs> it and at the same time uh you were so enthusiastic about uh buddy dancing to whoop there it is whoop there it is whoop there it is <laughs> you know that uh, uh that whole uh, part was uh, ad-libbed uh the only line i had when i went in to shoot that day was work release that's all i was supposed to say and uh, uh it was the very last day of shooting the movie it's in, in its entirety and so they were allowed to keep you and work you as long as they wanted to so uh favreau or john favreau the director and will ferrell uh decided to just have fun and play with the scene and everything you see past work release is all ad-libbed oh, oh man that's that's great and there's another mlp voice actor or actress that actually makes an appearance in that film, Brenda Cleachlow, who plays Zakora, the zebra, on My Little Pony. She appears as the uh, one of the workers who spots Miles Finch, the South Pole elf, walking over to the conference room. And this is Peter Dinklage before he hit it big with Game of Thrones. Yes, and uh, I just saw another movie that he starred in just this last weekend, which was wonderful. Uh, it was called Cyrano. Oh, and I heard was, of that. Yeah, a musical version of Cyrano de Bergerac, and he was incredible in it. Oh, okay, that's uh, that's good to know. So, uh, so, so, so now that uh, we we managed to get through some of the. Uh, the elf tidbits. <laughs> I might as well just uh, I might as well just start this off. Uh, okay, so My Little Pony was first created in 1983 or 1984 by Brenda. No, wait, Bonnie Zachary, a woman named Bonnie Zachary. Um, she uh wanted to make a toy line involving horses with multiple different colors, and she later said in a statement that she intended this, uh, this toy line for any gender, but Hasbro, who picked up the toy line, didn't really seem to be too keen on that. So they kind of marketed it as though this was only like for little girls. And then, uh, then you go through like two other generations where it was like uh, G2 and G3, and then it kind of... And then Hasbro was like, you know what? We may probably need to give this uh, property a new refresh. And they were like, and it seemed to be a good time because 2007, 2009, they had two big movies with Paramount 
with the Bayformers movies. Well, that's what I call them. Right? They're Transformers, but it's still a it's, it's nickname, Bayformers, because Michael Bay directed them. It's like, oh, you can play with your boy toys and stuff. Meanwhile, uh, <laughs> Lauren Faust, who of, who, of course, is the creator of the Equestria and the Lands in the show, wanted to, uh, came off of successfully doing a show called Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends on Cartoon Network. And... And she wanted to create a show involving uh, galaxy girls or something like that. And, and what ended up happening is uh, Hasbro approached her and said if she was particularly interested in uh, doing, this, doing this new version of My Little Pony. And she was like, yeah, I, I would love to. And she, she ended up uh, creating over the... Over, over the course of like 2008 through 2010, this world known as Equestria and all the inhabitants of the show. And the, inha and the inhabitants of the show um, are, are, well, I mean, these are the main characters that you see on my t-shirt. And at the same time, um, Lauren Fowles actually grew up with this property. She had a tendency to play with the toys, uh, make, uh, like, various lands as if as a kid she already had the idea of a question in her brain at the same time uh she also felt like you know this is a perfect opportunity for me to take something that would be for little girls but try to make it as though we wouldn't have to make it so much for little girls as it is for anyone who is, would be willing to watch it so she created this uh universe and uh and at the same time, Hasbro was looking to get into the entertainment business. They were watching a network called The Hub. I mean, it got my attention because uh, uh, Fraggle Rock was playing on that channel. I mean, I didn't really think too much about NLP, but, uh, but then all of a sudden, this uh, show premieres on 10, 10, 10, 20, October the 10th, 2010, 10, 10, 10, perfect number. And they... Uh, Cartoon Blue Ray releases this weird article as if uh, this was like a, as if they were trying to attack the concept of, oh, these, uh, these characters, uh, like they're trying to make cartoons only just to sell toys again. I mean, this is probably a garbage idea. We can't do, do this. We probably need more art in the cartoons or something like that. Um, and, then, and then suddenly 4chan starts making memes out of this. 4chan's, well, and now it's 8chan, now it's 8kun. I mean, this it's, cra it's one crazy message board that had all this uh, weird content that obviously would obviously had, has got them shadow banned multiple times. And people start making memes, and then it starts to spread outside of 4chan. And all of a sudden, college-aged guys like myself, I mean, back in the 2010s, I was in college, started, started gaining interest in this show. And I mean, it was just amazing that, uh, I guess it, the, it had the effect that Lauren Faust wanted to. It, it became a show for just about everyone. I mean, it's almost as if like, yeah, you, you have a favorite Disney movies. You, you like these Disney movies. Well, you got a show that so many people like. And at the same time, there's all these bullies who don't think guys, no, guys shouldn't be enjoying My Little Pony. I was a victim of one of those, yeah, because one day I ended up, uh, New Year's Eve 2011, I got, the curiosity got the better of me, and I went over to YouTube to watch the first step, two episodes, and then I, it was, I, I watched the first two episodes, and then I suddenly watched another one, another one, another one, another one. And, and by the time I just end up, New Year's Eve is finally done. I, I'm, I might have practically binge watched every episode up until the one where they tell the origins of Heart Swarming, which is basically their version of Christmas. And, and when I uh, finish, I somehow feel like, you know what? I've suddenly gotten a new interest. I mean, this this is so well developed. This is a this is a show that kind of makes me think of some of the shows I may have watched as a kid. And then uh, 
have this rich universe that they, that they crafted. And then everyone was just, everyone's interested. And uh, then one day I decided to walk into a Mickey D's, then unbox 2012 My Little Pony toys. And then I put that video on YouTube and then I was starting to get a bunch of hate and supporters. And, and once that ends up, up happening, I start to gain a big, a bigger following on YouTube, as if uh, people know me as just the guy who went into a Mickey D's. Although I actually want to try to make a name for myself and and do great things. I I'm a software engineer by trade because at My Little Pony, this was able to get me through the college years because this show um, I always made studying for all that. Uh, computer stuff, but I have one of the harder degrees. Harder to, uh, it was, it, it made this more tolerable. At least these guys just made my life more tolerable, more enjoyable. And, and I also feel like, um, um, oh, they, let me, let me say this that, uh, you know so much about the history and the wealth of knowledge that is uh, My Little Pony than almost anybody I've ever spoken to yet. And I've spoken to a lot of fans and I've spoken to a lot of people that are in support of the, of the cartoon series and about the world, the universe that it created when it did that. But you um, definitely our leader of the pack. You know so much about it. And uh, I think uh, that's an amazing thing. You know, it really is. And I, I want to speak to anybody that would have caused you concern or irritation or hurt by their callous remarks about you being supportive of this show. This show, and especially when I was able to make my contributions to the show, I felt was grounded in every aspect of humanity, not just women, but men, just as much. And that's what I hoped I would bring with Lord Tyrick, was the sense that uh, there's a guy's universe as part of this uh, female universe, and they all co-mingle, and they all interreact. And that what, that's what makes it even better than it was when maybe uh, plush toys were the main focus of the show and only for one gender in, instead of a, a universal sort of offering. So I just, uh, I, I think that uh, you're a great guy oh, and uh, uh, certainly extremely knowledgeable about the both in the front and then behind the story and how the story was made. You know, understanding the commercial aspects of this whole thing, as well as understanding what great writing and great arcing that was done throughout this, this uh, series. And I've always felt, always, that the chance that I got to be able to contribute to that show was one of the best opportunities I've ever gotten. Huh. Well, well it turns out uh, someone was... Uh trying someone was was trying to get in i mean, apparently is uh one of my friends just wanted to uh his name is russell hall he uh i i first met him at an a screening for equestria girls but then but then all of a sudden we discovered we had an interest beyond my little pony we were interested in marvel and dc comics speaking of you know when i first when i saw that guardians of the galaxy movie and I and then we're talking about the uh, the Infinity Stones, about well, at least they were trying to sell this uh, the the Power Stone to the collector. This this guy yeah. was from nowhere. When I showed those rocks, I I, did, I thought thought I honestly thought they were the elements of harmony. Apparently not, because I had not read the comics that frequently, so I might as well just. Uh, so I'm all, well, just it's okay to be wrong if I wasn't so in tune about Marvel, but uh, and now 
At this point, I'm really getting knowledgeable about Marvel. As a matter of fact, there's a character called the Night Nurse, which at, which they have MCU has not gotten to yet, but they definitely can if they definitely want to. <laughs> yeah, there was a, uh, a feature cartoon that I did way back in 2005 or six called uh, He Man versus Wolverine, and in it I played Sabretooth. Uh, that was my character and uh, when they hire you for uh, cartoons um, they go on the premise that it only has five years of life in it maximum so they buy you out worldwide for five years knowing that after that they won't ever have to use it again well uh, that cartoon feature became so popular that it's still running today, uh, um, 17 years later, it's wow. still running. And in fact, I, I um, made a video game and voiced a character very similar to Sabretooth, but they wouldn't allow him to be called Sabretooth in the video game. And uh, um, I did that for like two days straight recording that video game. So. There's a couple of pieces of me and Marvel out there. And um, I think it's one of my favorite things to binge watch when I'm watching TV. I, I like the Ant-Man series, I like Captain America series. Uh, Hulk took so many different transformations because every time there was another actor playing the Hulk, you know, Bruce Banner. And so um, you always got a completely different feel for every one of the Hulks, but they're all really good. I just think they've gotten progressively better. That's all. Yeah, and, uh, yeah exactly. We, especially with the t today's technology and the motion capture and trying to capture the uh, neat pores on the on the human skin, which is actually pretty hard to do with the uh, CG. But uh, <laughs> uh, technological advances can indeed help in uh, making our making entertainment more immersive and also making our world a much better place. And uh, Okay, so since I've managed to get uh, into the history of the show, maybe I should just uh, maybe I should start asking some of my questions here. Mm, did you know anything about My Little Pony or the surprise college aged male? Oh, I, I believe you already answered that question. Did you know anything about My Little Pony or the surprise college aged male demographic before taking on the voiceover role for the show? Well, I. Uh... Um, you know, you, you hear uh, things, but the, you know, you tend not to believe uh, uh, silly things, and you tend to believe what what the audience says. And the audience was always uh, super supportive of uh, uh, what we were doing. I went to a couple of different conventions, and the outpouring of feeling from uh, all of those attendees uh, was really quite uh, heartfelt it really meant something to me i got so many pictures with so many people uh that were fans of my work and other people's work that was was in the show and we had uh, great times both conventions and um um i i just think that uh, if i was to if i was able to bring in a more complete rich texture of real life so that it resonated for everyone then then that would be uh, more than i could ask because that's what i was trying to do i was trying to make him as real a character as i possibly could i remember when they were auditioning me they had lineups of guys and then they had some guys that could do the old weak voice of Tyrk a little better than me but they couldn't do the great big gigantic version of Tyrick. And then there was guys lined up that could do the great big gigantic version of Tyrick, probably a little bit uh, fuller than I could. But they couldn't do the, the weak old man well and separate the two voices so that you believe they were two different characters. But with, uh, with me, I was able to hit notes with both of those. And instead of having to hire two guys, Hasbro only had to hire one, and that was me. So I was real happy about that, that uh, 
that debut in the series, I thought that that was, of all my Lord Tyrick, that was the, probably the strongest piece of work that I had in it. And um, I, I can still remember the opening line. It's so haunting. Is he friend or is he foe? The pony wonders. I can assure you, I am no friend. And uh, that was the beginning of a beautiful marriage, you know, for a number of years. And uh, I enjoyed every moment of it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, whatever, uh, whatever we managed to get out of, uh, out of doing that, it's, it's not like I can. Uh, it, yeah, because you get you manage to get so much support, out, and uh, I, I mean I'm not I, I I'm I'm more I'm just a I'm just a fan I'm just a, a a guy who develops software for a living that really seems to like animation and, and cartoons and feels like as a hobby he he wants to make cartoons. Hey. Hey Russell, meet Mark Axon. He voices Lord Tirak on My Little Pony. Oh, like the uh, the crazy villain that ended up being Discord. Um, yeah, he <laughs> he, wants to do, he wants to get all the magic and 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 suck it up so he can just uh, he wants to get all the magic with questions so he can suck it up and then use it to like rule the world, like take over the world, and. Uh, yeah, that yeah. was kind of a cool. I liked that. It was like finally you had your Legion of Doom for MLP, basically. It was like so, like the you know the main six and some other characters like you know Sunset Shimmer or or uh, the one that you know the one that was Tr Twixie's Trixie's best friend. What's her name? Starlight Glamour. Yeah, Slight yeah. You know, and then, you know, the, all those characters, you know, had like, the, that was like the 70s super, super friends. And then, you know, the Legion of Doom, you know. So I was part of the Doom, was I? Yeah, you was like part of the Legion of Doom stuff, you know, like, like, you know, you, you're probably familiar with the old uh, super friend show where you had like the Justice League versus the Legion of Doom. Sure. So he's, so he's kind of like the leader of the Legion. I've already told him about uh, the, the history of MLP and uh, how I got into the show and my little incident with walking into a Mickey D's and then uh, filming my, uh, my, my tidbit. Well, just unboxing them, my little pony toys. And then I also told him um, that I also know him elsewhere from Elf and he told me that uh, the the only line that he had was work release, but then everything else after that was improv and then they had a few extra scenes. So John Favreau and Will Ferrell just decided to uh, decided to have a little fun with it and uh, and continue on with the with the mailroom scene. It wasn't like in the script, but uh, they they managed. To, he says that's probably the most well known of the roles that he's actually had. Which was the mailroom guy and Elf that buddy befriends. You want me to tell him my my how I became a Brony story? Oh, sh uh, ho hope it's not too loud. Okay. Uh, well, how I did was I'm a big Japanese anime fan, and I was looking up some information for the new Sailor Moon cartoon called Sailor Moon Crystal, and uh, after seeing one of the teasers uh, I saw a little video of what we now call derpy hooves or uh, cupcake or whatever you want you know muffin or whatever you want to use you know due to reasons but it's I remember seeing the video saying I'm sorry if I offended you and so I saw the video and uh it was apologizing for being different and stuff like that. So I did not know this character at all, but implying that it was making fun of autistic people, which I thought, well, if there's any truth to this, I might 
might as well investigate this. So I ended up finding the episode that, you know, Derpy first appears. I've seen, I watched both the edited and the non-edited versions. Didn't see really much of a problem. It, it, it didn't seem to me like it was attacking autistic people. I even know when, when my mother was still alive, I showed her both versions. And she says, you know, having a son with uh, autism, she didn't see nothing wrong with it. And I said, well, maybe there's something before this episode that might might have said something up. And it was like maybe in like an inside joke or an inside, you know, writer's inside joke that or something like that. So I ended up starting from season one, episode one, and ended up becoming a fan due to the fact that I noticed that the content was not attacking people. It was being it was more inclusive than most American cartoons and ended up enjoying the show for what it was. You know, it was just a fun show that you didn't have to worry about, you know, people punching down on you and and uh, worry about getting offended in any way. You know, the, the even the cartoony violence was not as, you know, bad as some some stuff that's that they let children watch in Japan. So, uh, you know, after that, you know, you just scroll down from there and became a big fan till season nine, you know, till it ended. Well, uh, for for me, uh, I uh, I was I was having growing pains right at the time of season nine, and then uh, and then uh, career troubles. I had to adapt. I changed jobs. I had the infamous car, car wreck, and I and the case went too long. And then the pan pandemic happened, and uh, the wildfires, and the race riots, and race protests, and the uh, all all. And the, all that stuff. Now, like capping over to uh, the the big war that's happening right now in Russia and Ukraine, which of course just breaks my little heart right here. Just to let you know, um, I haven't really watched an MLP episode in three years. So returning to this universe was a little a little bittersweet for me, so to speak. In other words, you, in other words, what you're saying is you actually just kind of marathon one, one through nine. One through ninth, oh, zero nine, oh, th one through zero nine, oh, three. And then the career trouble started happening and I had to grow in my job. That's what happened. Well, I hope well, that, uh, uh, I, I think that you probably have grown very much, uh, um, what I can tell, and uh, and I wish you, uh, you know, like only more growth, like the rest of us do. We all need to grow all the time. And um, when I ended a series and when I started a new one, I, I just finished a, a feature for Disney. It's a remake of uh, Peter Pan. It's going to be called Peter and Wendy with uh, Jude Law and um, I worked four months on that and just finished up uh, additional scenes and dialogue they gave me this last February. But it should be coming out in the theaters uh, this summer. Or Disney Plus. Or Disney Plus streaming on Disney Plus, yeah. So there will be no theatrical version of this. You know, in, in other words, you won't be able to see this in theaters. You can only see it on Disney Plus. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know Disney's strategy. You could just dunk on Disney all day, but. Uh, what, what, no, I was asking him personally. He might know. <laughs> He's a cast member. Well, cast I'm members always sure got the. It's going to be released in theaters for a little while, I believe. A little while. Okay, that's, yeah. that's cool. Like, like yeah. the El Capitan Theater in Hollywood. That's a theater that exclusively shows. Disney stuff, or well, exclusive Disney premieres anyway. That's, that's what you know. Okay, so- Well, I, I would think that uh, um, with all of our Caribbean flair, as far as being pirates aboard that ship, uh, we'll be able to make the grade into the El Capitan. El Capitan, yeah. Okay, so number two, pretty much all, almost all the cast of the show were Canadian. How did that factor into how a show like this gets made in Canada by a Canadian animation studio? 
Well, um, there's there's a, a number of the cast that are um, Canadian, that's for sure. But um, um, a lot of my work uh, was done uh, solo. Um, the uh, the actor, the well known actor that uh, played my cohort, you know, and uh, uh, was so good. John Delancey was so good in doing it that um, um, he recorded in L.A. and uh, I recorded in Vancouver. So we never met. We never, ever met. Even though we had uh, numbers of scenes together, we never met once. Um, there's, there's a lot of reasons why uh, cartoons are an international sort of um, project whenever they're done. And that is because um, for a lot of different reasons, and not the first one always being money. I know that that's what most people think, that it's always about the money. But, it, you know, saving a bunch of money doesn't make any uh, sense at all if you don't come out with the product that you're proud of at the end of the day. And I think that uh, with the pool of vocal talent, and then the pool of production people down in the States. And then um, input from all over the place. I, I remember I did a, a cartoon series uh, um, a long time ago called uh, Big, Fi uh, Big Dog, uh, Fat Dog Mendoza. Fat Dog Mendoza. And I played the title role, Fat Dog Mendoza. And when I got this part, there was a director in LA on the phone, a director in New York on the phone, and a director in Dublin on the phone. Uh, and they were there all the time uh, for the next year and a half while I recorded uh, 26 episodes of, of uh, Fat Dog Mendoza. And so that again was a, a world community coming together to try to make a singular product. Oh, yeah. So uh, being united and uh, def and definitely uh, connecting remote, especially now with the technology we have. And uh, I, I work from home. That's, that's, my, that's my old job now. I work from home. I mean, my, even before the pandemic, mom told me it would be a good idea that I work from home. And uh, now, now here I am. I'm working from home. And it, it seems to work. Well, most Not of the population has, has figured this out, especially in the last two years of COVID, that uh, there are so many things you can do without having to leave your door, you know? And yeah. in the end, that leaves less of a carbon footprint. In the end, it usually results in higher productivity. And in the end, it uh, overall adds to um, um, a life well lived, you know? Oh, uh, yeah, because I, I, I seem to have st i seem to be a benefit from that so uh um i think uh, so next question um do you remember the first time you met a brony did any of them know you were an elf um i remember the first convention i attended um i uh, went to the hotel and there was a lineup and there was three other voice actors and myself in the lineup waiting to check in. Uh, I hadn't been there for about three or four minutes until somebody uh, pointed out from the door and said, uh, hold it, you're the guy from Elf, you know, and quickly came over for uh, a picture with me and stuff like that. The other three actors in the lineup uh, weren't entirely <laughs> impressed by me <laughs> because there's a certain degree of anonymity that comes with being a uh, voice in a cartoon series. Probably uh, some of the wealthiest, most 
uh, successful people in the business are, are invisible, such as the vocal talents that go behind The Simpsons, which turned out to be the longest running syndicated cartoon series during prime time it was ever made, ever made. <laughs> yeah. And those all people became multimillionaires, and yet nobody would recognize them at the grocery store. But because I was in one 22 hour long day of shooting on the very last day of Elf, because they play that from Thanksgiving until New Year's, every year without fail, I am constantly having my vision, my face and my work rebroadcast because I was lucky enough to be in a Christmas classic. And that's what it turned out to be. You know, Will Ferrell was offered a lot of money to make an elf too. And he didn't go anywhere near it because he knew, he knew that when something is a standalone perfect item that is good family christmas movie funny good story great ending one of those only comes along once in a while you know yeah and uh um for me uh um him not doing another elf uh only added to the value of the original elf you know, <laughs> and another proof that money doesn't always dictate what happens in, in Hollywood. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, basically the whole, I mean, at, at first I kind of made a mistake when I'm trying to attend my first convention and I met Tara Strong. I, I made a mistake by trying to record or always do an interview by didn't know how it was how right. things were supposed to be done i i just uh it wasn't supposed to be the way i did it because my brain had done a convention before my brain hadn't done interviews before i it's a new thing and when i'm trying to do a new thing it always seems to seem, seem to not be the way you want to have i tried to ask him about why the, all, all the characters were female uh, he just basically responded because they're awesome and all I, and later, I suddenly found out it's a matriarchy. the The entire setup of the of the My Little Pony universe in Equestria is a matriarchy. That is where the ruling class are all female. Now, in the real world, it's like the opposite. Though we are making some progress, the vice president is now a woman. A woman of a different ethnicity, no, mind you, but Kamala Harris is no fairy godmother. <laughs> I don't really expect her to just, uh, oh, wave a magic wand and then boom, hey guys, you turn a pumpkin into a carriage and all, all that stuff. Or just make me into a handsome man. <laughs> uh, uh, she, she used to be a, a prosecutor in Los Angeles, and so she knows the hard dark edge of real life and and all of it no fairy godmother there uh deaf okay so uh all right so how exactly would a show whose original target audience is prepubescent girls which unexpectedly got a college-aged male audience where all the main characters are female and they act so three-dimensionally how does that motivate young girls to do great things is a matriarchy on a kid show a good idea Well, let me uh, put it this way. Um, I've done a number of cartoon series in my day. Uh, I've been lucky enough to be on Transformers playing two different voice roles in that show. I've done roles in uh, uh, Marvel, which uh, I'm uh, very happy about. Uh, uh, Masters of the Universe, I had roles in that. G.I. Joe, way back when, I had roles in that. And most of them all were male-centric uh, projects. There was the odd female, but very few and far between. And so if My Little Pony evened up the scales a little bit so that women got the lion's share of the attention 
and men just filled in where they needed to. I got no problem with that. What uh, voices did you do for Transformers and uh, E-Man? I did uh, Unicron and Crumple Zone in Transformers. And I did uh, Fisto in uh, He-Man, uh, plus a couple of other characters, which I can't remember right off the bat. That's cool, man. It's nice to meet some stuff from my childhood, like Transformers and He-Man and stuff like that, had the toys. But I think the reason why Jordan passed that question is, you know, in the 80s, you know, you had your, your girl toy line and you had your boy toy line. And therefore, you know, of course, the toy line, the toy line had to represent what the cartoon was about, you know. You know, Transformers were mostly male uh good or evil it wasn't until like the 86 movie where you finally get to see a a first female you know transformer rc and you know ever since she appeared in that film she's you know it's been a constant and they've just continuously added more female characters to the uh transformer roster you know as years have gone like that like the netflix trilogy you have the you have rc but you also have some other female Autobots, you know, leaders and stuff like that. And I thought that was pretty cool to, as a show, a nod to the 86 film, but also expanded upon and made Transformers more available for females, you know, especially if, if young, young, you know, girls could look up to instead of just Optimus Prime, they had some strong female characters they could look up to in the, in the newer Transformer series that uh, Netflix had produced. Well, I, I, I uh, totally agree with you. I would just only say that this has been uh, a, a, a growing trend with all of the shows. Uh, if you look at the uh, Marvel movies in the last uh, five years, you'll see that it's gone strictly uh, uh, towards the balance between male and female characters and that some of their best franchises turn out to be the, the female ones. So uh, I, I think this is just a natural progression of how things should go. And uh, uh, every series that I've done has had a generation or two before it, you know? And so I know that there was another guy reading Lord Tyrick a long time ago in another series completely. And I take homage to the fact that, uh, that we had the, the joint responsibility of trying to bring back a character and bring him uh, into enough life so that he wouldn't eclipse the other past uh, Lord Tyrix, but he would make a mark as his own. And uh, if uh, I was able to do that, then again, I feel like I've accomplished more than I could ask for. Oh, now that's uh, good to hear. Because, um, uh, I mean, okay, so fifth question. Outside of Tyrek, who do you think is your favorite character on the show and why? Oh, well, um, I'll give a, a nod to uh, uh, my female accomplice during the last three or four episodes, uh, Cozy Glow. Uh, I thought that uh, she was great and delicious and uh, not requiring bombast to carry, but rather a sly kind of wit and a cunning sort of mentality throughout the, her reign as a, a female uh, uh, League of Doom. Oh, well, I mean, uh, I mean I, well, that was like uh, one of those, uh, oh, it turned out to be, it, it was like, one of those moments where all of a sudden you get that. You, have you seen Frozen? Uh, I, I, I think so. Yeah. Uh, it was like, it was like all of a sudden you 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 get a sudden change in in the in the character. So oh my god, yeah, you, oh my god, you're a oh, bad yeah, guy yeah, or yeah. something like that. It's like you you know that the character that uh, that. Anna falls for like 
yeah. Hans, yeah. Hans of the Southern Isles. He, 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 he turns out he was only trying to, trying to, trying to marry him, just marry her just to get, get some power on the throne and, and it's like, okay, I'm just making all this advantage. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to be the hero. And then it, it, not only that was a wrong idea, but then uh, everyone, by, by the time that film came out and everyone saw, like, everyone probably knew that this was a guy not to be trusted after seeing it. So I was like, okay, might as well, uh, might as well roll with it. So. Well, that's what they call in, in the business uh, a reveal. And a reveal has uh, a momentum and an importance all its own because it causes you to do a juxtapose on what you were thinking about a character to a whole new way of thinking about the character. And to do that believably as an actor, it requires a lot of uh, great writing, a lot of good direction, and a lot of intuition about how not to overplay it, but give little hints of it. And then when the final reveal comes, savor it for all it's worth. Okay. Um, I'm not really like a, a, a big fan of the uh, surprise villain thing, but uh, I, but maybe when it's like done well, then, then, then that's probably when I would probably get invested as if, uh, as if I wouldn't have to uh, complain so much about a sudden changing the character it's like it's not like i'm just i'm like i'm being aggressive of on all that so uh so just because your fantasy land is a matriarchy doesn't make many males any less do you believe that if so then why well uh, of, of course uh, i believe that I, I think that uh whenever you have strong women you tend to end up with stronger men and that uh, um, even though it is, and it's true, it's a matriarch uh, society, um, Lord Tyrick and the other guys in the show uh, do a wonderful way to represent our part of the universe as best and as strong as we possibly can. And still be within side of a matriarch sort of society. Which is cool. Well, um, I was only doing this just to uh, wrap up uh, Women's History Month, and this is a cartoon created by a girl and uh, well, a woman, not mind you, and and a cartoon that was originally thought to be for girls, but then shattered expectations of what a cartoon for that cartoon de for that demographic should be. But it ended up. Uh, end up getting this unexpected audience of college age guys. And uh, I, I was, uh, I, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty good to know that uh, we have, a, have college age guys looking up to, that, that liked this show back in the 2010s. And uh, I, I, I think I might be able to return it to it when I start to share this with my kids for my nieces and nephews. Probably the same with a lot of the other uh, bronies out there. They might, uh, they might get to a point where they'll be like, okay, I, might, I'll, I, I can wait, get returned to it once I, uh, once I sh share this with my nieces and nephews and uh, kids and stuff like that. It's like a, a generation thing just to show you that you, uh, that, that you can pass down to your kids. I mean, what, what do your kids think about this? Well, I think that's a great legacy. I mean, um, entertainment, wherever it comes from, however long it's been, if it resonates and it makes people happy, then that's the most important thing. I mean, I, I have uh, um, comedy... Uh, legends in my mind that go way, way back. Uh, I'm talking like uh, uh, the Marx Brothers oh. and, and, and uh, that kind of, of, of talent always shines. If you ever get a chance to watch uh, Animal Crackers or Horse Feathers or Night of the Opera or Day of the Races, you're going to see some excellent, excellent work. 
done by people who knew how to do crafted work way back then. Oh. Now, this isn't a lost art. We, we continue to pick up and try to do the best we can, but it's always based on the foundation that the, those that went before us did some incredible things. And so when you hand over to your kids and maybe to their kids, the whole concept of My Little Pony, you're adding to the universe. You're creating a bigger audience. You're making it more accepting all the time of being open to all those ideas that at first were hard for some people to get their heads around. And you're the, you're the, the, um, the guide. You're the one that creates the path. You're the pathfinder. Oh, and you. well, it's just, that's the truth. And uh, I, uh, I can only hope that uh, when interest in My Little Pony uh, surfaces again as something that uh, Hasbro or somebody else would like to take advantage of, that I won't be old enough to uh, not get involved. But um, like I said, I had a wonderful tenure on that show. I'll always look back at it fondly. Great respect for everybody that I worked with and one of the best opportunities I had as an actor. And I've had a lot of opportunities, but that one, that one was special. And uh, well, I, 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 I got to go, um, but I wanted to say thank you so much for this. Oh, oh well, you're, you're a pretty chill bro, man. It's nice to okay, actually meet somebody down, behind the scenes, Mark. Because. Well, thank you very much. And, and you two guys are, are the salt of the earth. And, uh, yeah. I have so much respect for you. And and when you say you're just a fan, don't think that for a second. What you are is you're a fan. That's the only reason why any of this works. That's the only reason why I ever get a paycheck at the end of the day is because there's people like you out there who care and are interested and they watch and they listen and they understand and they accept. And all of that is a gift to me, always a gift, a true treasure. And I want to thank you both for, for taking time out to talk to me and making me feel like a big wheel again. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I want to thank you so much, Jordan. Uh, you're a hell of a guy. And hang in there and do great things. And I will wait to hear from you. Okay? Okay. But in general, it works... This, but you know, on my time with you is definitely great because, because you, you're definitely not uh, some guy who, as I've suddenly found out, like just last night, while I wasn't really feeling as good, that you're just gonna <laughs> walk up to a guy on live television and 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 just sissy slap the heck out of the guy. You're not got, gonna be that kind of person. And yeah, he's not gonna be Will Smith. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no. That no, was. I think. I think he. I think he's got a better headspace than Will Smith. Let's just put it that way. Oh, gee. Yeah. Well, I. I, uh, I hope so. I saw uh, clips of that, and I got to say that uh, on behalf of all actors out there, all performers, that was outrageous, man. That was. Uh, yeah, he went nanners, full nanners. Oh, yeah. Man. I was shocked. Really shocked. I don't condone that. And this is this is a show that that I love. This is a show that does not promote violence. I mean, you know who would make a good, great stand-up comedian? Pinkie Pie. <laughs> well, make sure that I get invited to the first time you're standing up because I want to see it. Okay. Anyway, I'll, All right. I'll see you later, guys. Okay, bye. Thanks again. Thank you so much.